Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Kirsi Isoherranen, and I'm a specialist in dermatology in Helsinki University Central Hospital, Helsinki Wound Healing Center, Finland. And I am also currently the Yuma Honorary Treasurer and Yuma Executive Committee member of the European Wound Management Association. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to the Yuma webinar on atypical wounds, diagnosis and treatment. Before I introduce the webinar and the speakers, I would like to announce you that Yuma is about to launch the e-learning course on atypical wounds, which is based on the Yuma's recent document on atypical wounds, best clinical practices and challenges. You will get more information within the next few weeks on Yuma's website and social media about this e-learning model. This webinar will be recorded, so you will be able to watch the video recording on demand. The recording should be available on Yuma's website as well within the next few days. And you can request a certificate of attendance for live participation in the webinar, where you need to attend maximum 70% of the live webinar. And each speaker will have 12 to 15 minutes, and there will be also 15 minutes at the end of the webinar to ask questions. And please type your question in the question box in the panel. And I would ask that you type your question as soon as you have one and include also the country you are based in. And the speakers will answer as many as they can during the final 15 minutes. And I am really pleased to welcome the speakers for today's webinar. My dear Spanish friend, Elena Conde Montero, MD, PhD, dermatologist, Hospital Universitario Infanta Leonor y Virgen de la Torre, Spain. And she will be talking about diagnosis and treatment of martorel hypotensive ischemic leg ulcer. And then Julie Jordan O'Brien, my dear co-editor of the Atypical Wounds document, She's an RNP, MSc Nursing, Advanced Nurse Practitioner, Plastic Surgery, Beaumont Hospital, Ireland, and she will provide a deep dive into topical treatment in atypical wounds. And I myself will start the first presentation where I will provide you with an introduction to atypical wounds and their treatment. And I hope that you can see my slides. Can you give Elena a mark? Do you see? Yes, great. So this is a real topic of the heart for me because I dare to claim that every one of us, including myself, self, have been treating an atypical wound without knowing that it is an atypical wound and that it is that is why it is so important to give more, more information about this topic. And the learning objectives of this webinar will be that after this webinar, you should have a better understanding of atypical wounds and recognize the main clinical features of the main types of atypical wounds and be able, able to describe the main treatment and management of atypical wounds. And atypical wounds are not so rare than thought before. They comprise about 10 to 20% of all chronic wounds treated in wound clinics. And simply, they can be thought as wounds that do not fall into the typical wound categories, that is venous leg ulcers, arterial ulcers, mixed venous and arterial ulcers, pressure ulcers, and diabetic foot ulcers. And, I, and as I said before, they really challenge the clinician in terms of diagnosis and treatment. And the treatment also often needs an atypical approach, different from the traditional wound management. 
for instance, immune suppressive treatment or corticosteroids topically. And as said before, in 2019, we published this document on atypical wounds and it is freely downloaded in Yuma website. And this webinar and also our e-learning module is based on this document. And if you want more deep information, please go and read this document. And again, to be simple, when to suspect an atypical wound? When the wound does not fall into the typical category, as mentioned before, and then you have an intuition that the wound has an atypical location or, or appearance, or there, there is pain out of proportion of the wound size, or the wound does not heal with a good treatment, that is local treatment, compression therapy, offloading within four to 12 weeks. And this is very important that in this phase, you stop and think whether you have the right diagnosis. Because there can be considerable delay in diagnosis. We've seen pyoderma gangrenosum wounds treated as infected with revision and antibiotics. We've seen melanomas treated as diabetic neuropathic ulcers, and this can lead that the patient dies because of the melanoma. We've seen squamous cell carcinomas treated as venous leg ulcers, HS treated as an abscess, or martorel and calciphylaxis ulcers treated with immune suppressants. And Elena will go more deeply in her presentation into this topic. This is a table about the main types of atypical wounds. Of course, there are many dermatological diseases that are rare and can cause atypical wounds, but these firstly mentioned in this table are the most typical. Vasculitis, PG, pyoderma gangrenosum, occlusive vasculopathies, martorel, calciphylaxis, adenitis suppurativa, HS, which is linked with pyoderma gangrenosum, Malignant wounds, artifactal ulcers, ectuma and ectuma gangrenosum that are linked with immune suppression and are infectious wounds. And this is just to show you that every wound patient needs a really holistic assessment. It is really true the saying that it is not just the hole in the patient, it is the whole patient. You need to take the detailed history about the patient, and this can already give you clues about the etiology. And you must do a very good physical examination. And always one of the first things is the exclusion of arterial insufficiency. Also, whether you think at instantly that this could be an atypical wound, because there can be also arterial insufficiency in these patients. Then if there is signs of venous insufficiency, you should perform duplex ultrasound. You should also test for peripheral neuropathy. And then after these examinations, if the wound cannot be classified as typical or does not heal with good treatment within four to 12 weeks, then you should go into more deep uh, investigations. You should take a deep biopsy enough and it needed immune fluorescent specimen and also biopsies for tissue culture for bacteria, fungi, yeast and mycobacteria and an, uh, an array of laboratory investigations. And now I will just show you some pictures about the main types of atypical wounds. Vasculitic ulcers are an inflammatory reaction of the blood vessel wall, and the typical clinical signs are palpable purpura, as you see in this patient, vivero racemosa, that is a purple network around the ulcers, and necrotic ulcers, as you can see in this patient. First line treatment, high dose corticosteroids usually in dermatological wards. And very importantly, do not 
deprived in the acute phase because these ulcers have the pathology phenomenon, so they worsen with trauma. Then pyoderma, neutrophilic inflammation of the skin, and it is often associated with inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, or hematologic malignancy. And this again is, can be one clue for the diagnosis if the patient has one of these. And the same as with vasculitic ulcers, do not deprive in the acute phase because of the pathogen phenomenon. And also here, first-line therapy, corticosteroids, or cyclosporin in some cases. And pioderma can occur also post-surgically, and here can be also a delay in diagnosis. It has been said that pioderma gangrenosum is the diagnosis you wish you should never have operated, because operations can really make the wounds worse. As in this case, a patient of mine, a 50 years old man with rheumatoid arthritis, and he went to surgical emergency after noticing a one centimeter diameter abscess, one centimeter here in the left shoulder. And this is the situation after three surgical revisions. So after each revision, the wound enlarges. Then after the third revision, someone somebody thought this might be something else than an infected abscess. Well, we started then high dose corticosteroids and the patient was performed a skin graft. And two years later, he came again and happily this shoulder area was, was uh, without wound and looked healthy, but he had a new ulcer in his leg. So it is, pioderma gangrenosum is a disease that can come again. And I would like to show a picture about livedoid vasculopathy, because I think this might also be misdiagnosed as typical venous leg ulcers, sometimes also vasculitis. They are recurrent, small, painful, symmetrical ulcerations in both ankles. And typically, they become worse during summertime. And there is atrophy blanche that is like a scar tissue, a white scar tissue around the ulcers. The typical patient is a young or middle-aged woman. And liveroid vasculopathy is associated with prothrombotic conditions. And the main treatment is anticoagulants with compression. Here you can see a male patient of 40 years old. He had been suffering from venous leg ulcers for 10 years. He lived in a distant place of Finland and came to us for consultation because uh, the ulcers were still, despite compression and venous operations, and then we saw this atrophy blanche here in his feet. And then we thought there might be also libidoid vasculopathy with venous leg ulcers. We started anticoagulant therapy and the situation got better instantly. And of course, compression. Malignant wounds very often might look as ordinary wounds at first sight. And that is why it's so important to take biopsy of every wound does not heal at, at least within 12 weeks. In one study, a prevalence was as high as 10% of all chronic wounds treated in, wound, in a tertiary wound clinic. Uh, malignant wounds can be divided as primary malignant and secondary malignant wounds. This was a basalioma, that is a primary malignant wound. Here you can also see a basalioma. And here you can see a secondary malignant wound. This ulcer had been for 20 years. It was uh, post-traumatic, but of course there was also venous insufficiency. But then during the last year, it had become more protruded 
and it was a squamous cell carcinoma. So it was like a martyrial ulcer and needed, of course, large revisions and crafts. Artefactal ulcers are associated with personality disorders. This is an important clue. And this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you often have to take the biopsies and laboratory tests also to convince the patient and so that you get a good doctor patient relationship. You should not ab abandon these patients and not discard them too early. And a psychiatric psychological referral is very warmly recommended. The problem is that these patients often refuse of these referrals. Then a physician can try also like serotonin reuptake inhibitors or other kind of psychiatric medications if he has a good relationship with the patient. Again, I cannot highlight too much this. If the wound does not heal within four to 12 weeks with good local compression or floating therapy, take a biopsy or refer the patient to a specialist who can do it. And you do not have to get the exact diagnosis for an atypical wound, but it, it is important that you suspect it earlier and know where to refer the patient. Usually dermatologists are experts in diagnosing these wounds, but after diagnosis, clearly a multidisciplinary approach is needed. Last but not least, patient perspective. These patients have really uh, lowered quality of life because of pain, persistent wounds, immune suppressive treatments, delay in diagnosis. They have also increased mortality, especially in pyoderma and calciphylaxis wounds. And in HS patients, there are nice reports about the lowered health-related quality of life and also increased suicide risk. So this is a patient group that really matters. Here are my references. And then my last slide, I want to highlight that this is really teamwork. We cannot treat these patients alone. Thank you. And please, if you have questions, uh, write them right away at the Q&A chat box. And then now I would like to introduce the second speaker, Dr. Elena Conde Montero. And she will also ask you one question. Please, Elena. Thank you, Kirsi, for this uh, extremely interesting introduction. So uh, I would like to ask you two questions before starting my presentation. So the first question, let's see if you have it there. Yeah. So do you find it difficult to differentiate pyodyma gangrenosum and martyrial ulcer? You have 30 seconds to answer this question. Yes or no? Okay, <laughs> so do I. <laughs> well, it's not uh, an easy uh, differential diagnosis. Okay, so let's continue with the second question. Uh, let's see if you can find it there in your screens. I don't know if you can read the question, but I will read it for you. Do you find martyrial ulcer a treatment challenge? Let's see, yes or no. And I'll tell you my answer later too. Mm 
Okay. <laughs> well, uh, just imagine all of you answer no, so uh, we have no room for this webinar. So uh, yeah, so let's hope that this webinar helps you to reduce the challenge of diagnosing and um, treating martial legacy. So now I start with my presentation, but before focusing on Martial Legacies, I would like to give you some clues to differentiate these ulcers from other entities that uh, may present with similar clinical features, such as pain, um, necrotic and purpuric edges, and uh, a rapid spread of the ulcer. So these two, these main entities are PD, pyoderma gangrenosum, and calciphylaxis. So, uh, well, Kirsi has just talked about uh, key features of PD. So I would uh, remark that we will find these lesions typically in middle-aged people. We will see later that uh, martial leg ulcer will typically appear in older people than pyoderma gangrenosum in general. So it's very important when the patient has history of uh, chronic bowel uh, inflammatory disease or hematological malignancy or rheumatologic, rheumatological problems. So pay attention to the patient's history when you see these necrotic lesions, very painful, because this will give you very important clues. So, and as Kersi say, even if we, when we see this ulcer, we just want to uh, remove all that necrotic, necrotic tissue. Uh, don't do that uh, when inflammation is not controlled because uh, the ulcer will worsen due to this uh, pathology phenomenon. So the typical evolution is, as Kersi said, the initial pustule or nodule that uh, starts uh, uh, enlarging very quickly and uh, very painful. We see these undermined edges and this uh, tissue, this uh, wound bed tissue with lots of slap. This is very typical. So this is an inactive pyoderma gangrenosum successfully treated. The pyoderma gangrenosum is a neutrophilic inflammation, an uncontrolled inflammation. So the uh, strategy, the therapeutic strategy will be immunosuppressant agents. And when we have controlled this inflammation, we will be able to use a negative pressure therapy, skin grafts. But first of all, and this is essential, we have to uh, reduce this inflammation. And uh, let's move to the other differential diagnosis, um, calciphylaxis. Now we have to pay attention to the his patient history. So when we have a patient with uh, end-stage chronic kidney disease undergoing dialysis, uh, this very painful and necrotic ulcer that spreads very quickly, think about calciphylaxis. Uh, we typically found, find these uh, necrotic plaques, very painful, as I said, and uh, the problem with calciphylaxis is that lesions spread very quickly and prognosis is very poor with a high mortality rate. This does not happen with martyrdom like ulcer. These patients won't have this end uh, kidney disease end stage kidney disease. Um, martial, patients with martial leg ulcer will typically uh, present hypertension. So um, it, martial leg ulcer was traditionally associated to poorly controlled high, high blood pressure. But now we found more and more patients with long-standing uh, hypertension, very well controlled, but long-standing. And uh, these patients uh, normally uh, have diabetes and the typical location of these ulcers is the lateral aspect of the leg and the Achilles tendon areas. So this is very typical. These are clues to suspect um, martial ulcers. But calciphylaxis and martial ulcers are not that different. In fact, they share pathophysiology. In fact, both of them have 
subcutaneous arterial sclerosis. And this can, can be found if we perform a biopsy. This biopsy should be wide and deep and uh, spin spindle-shaped to, uh, to, to find these features. And uh, so if these both entities share the same um, histology and pathophysiology and also uh, some risk factors, it's easy to understand that they may share the same treatment. And this is very interesting because obviously in these cases, we will always um, control risk factors. Um, the, for instance, uh, vitamin K antagonists should be stopped because they will uh, prevent uh, a specific, a specific protein complex to avoid uh, cal uh, cal calcium formation. So, but I will talk about uh, the best painkiller strategy in both calciphylaxis and, and martial ulcers. These are skin grafts and we have uh, different modalities uh, for small ulcers. Um, punch grafting is a, it's a very good option. We will talk about it later. And when we have large ulcers with lots of necrotic tissue, necrosectomy and mesh grafts is a perfect combination. We can also use negative pressure therapy. So these are typical, uh, this is the typical um, aspect of uh, martial leg ulcers with this, uh, this is the Achilles tendon area with this necrotic tissue, this um, erythema and purpuric color in the perlicinal skin. This, even if we, uh, we can, if, if we want to, um, Mm, to make a differential diagnosis with a biopsy uh, because we want to uh, um, to uh, to know that, uh, for instance, this lesion is not pyoderma gangrenosum, we will take a biopsy, but uh, sometimes pyoderma uh, martial ulcers are very typical clinically, so we don't need to perform a biopsy. It, it can be a clinical diagnosis, and in some cases, as this case here, lesions can be bilateral. This is quite typical. So let's focus on the starting treatment in our clinics regarding martial ulcers. And this is punch grafting. Um, it's like magic, in fact, because it does not only promote epithelialization, but also reduces pain, which is very important for these um, patients. And it will uh, also, stop the ulcers from spreading. So what is punch grafting? So it's a kind of thin dermopidal graft that includes epidermis and papillary dermis. And it's a procedure very simple and efficient that can be performed in an outpatient basis. This is the material uh, we need. There you see the point bleeding that informs us that we are in at the level uh, expected. And uh, the, the donor side is normally the thigh, the lateral aspect of the thigh. And it, this, uh, this uh, wounds there will close by secondary intention. And it's very important, the immobilization and local pressure uh, from the first, uh, the first days after the procedure. We, for taking the, uh, the grafts, first of all, we have to put some local anesthetics there. Uh, infiltrated and um, we can use a surgical blade as we use normally, but you could also use a punch or a curette. These are the colors we adore, pink and blue uh, during dressing changes. Uh, we don't like that much when we find yellowish punch uh, uh, grafts on the wound, but the most important thing is not to touch anything. For instance, this is a martial leg also that we grafted in these terrible conditions, we, we normally try to, um, to cleanse the, the wound and divide uh, the most we can, but uh, these are very painful lesions. And even if no punch grafts adhere to the wound, they will release growth factors and cells interesting for um, uh, epithelialization and they will reduce pain. 
So we, in this case, we had to regraft. It's not a problem to graft another time, several times, because the patient is a very well tolerated procedure by the patient. So in this case, we had to regraft, and this is one week after the second procedure, and two weeks later, we have complete epithelialization. So this was achieved in six weeks. And we can, uh, as we said before, we can also use a negative therapy, a pressure therapy, to promote uh, punch uh, graft adherence. And this is another example where we uh, achieved a nearly complete epithelialization, but we have to regraft. And I repeat, it's not a problem to perform the procedure once again, and we had complete epithelialization. So um, even if we don't have the perfect wound bed to graft, patients with marginal agalsis will benefit from early grafting, not only to uh, stop uh, necrosis from spreading, not only for promoting epithelialization, but for pain. These two patients I've sh shown you before uh, had nearly no pain after the procedure. So we've published this case where we um, perform the punch grafting procedure very early. This is two weeks later, four weeks later, and complete epithelialization seven weeks after grafting this uh, terrible goon bed, but with no pain after the procedure. And this is a success and successful treatment treatments are what we want in our clinics. This is part of my team. And well, if you want to know more about the procedure, uh, this is the web page you can, uh, uh, where you can search for uh, more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, for this brilliant presentation. And please, if you have any questions to Elena, write them in the Q&A part. And the next presentation will be by Julie Jordan O'Brien. Please, Julie. Okay, I hope you can see my screen now. <laughs> Great, okay. So um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the topical treatments for the atypical wounds. And as Kirsty and Elena have both very, very um, uh, recently uh, demonstrated, it is um, a, a kind of very challenging um, type of wounds. And I think the poll is very, very um, indicative there that people find them challenging. And indeed, because of the delay in diagnosis that Kersey has also highlighted, many of these patients have tried many, many different topical treatments before they get the right diagnosis. And so they may be a little frustrated coming into your clinic. And uh, we do need to you know, uh, treat them with kid gloves and get them involved in their treatment because they are a huge resource for us to try and establish, as we said, a, a, a good history and then get a plan or a topical treatment into place. So we do need an interdisciplinary teamwork. Uh, communication is key here, as with any project. All of these people need to be involved with the patient in the middle to establish what is the diagnosis. And certainly from some of the photographs that Elena showed there, I would have uh, certainly a lot of uh, trouble trying to diagnose uh, the difference between a martyrell and um, vasculitis or a calcial axis. So we do um, have to get all our colleagues' uh, heads together and come up with a plan of care. And um, this can't be done as an individual or on an individual wound. We need to have a team approach and resources mightn't always be available uh, from country to country, they're different. And also from environment to environment, they very much vary as well. So you have to take into consideration with industry and with our uh, organization, what we have available to us and what uh, the patient uh, will tolerate. So um, I can't really talk about what to put on a wound until I really do a holistic assessment and establish what is wrong with the patient. And these are the little clues that Elena has talked about uh, how to establish uh, what is 
appropriate for an atypical wound as a topical treatment before we can actually uh, implement them, we have to have that biopsy and that diagnosis. So if we start really with the green area, the systemic, um, which was mentioned by Elena and Kersey, we must actually take into consideration, you know, is it an artifact or are there psychosocial issues involved and are they on the right medication? Do they have comorbidities such as renal disease or liver disease that's going to impede their wound healing? And then if we focus on the red area, the regional area, do they have venous disease that's going to impede um, maybe cause more oedema and therefore compression is really important. But the problem with putting compression on atypical wounds is very often they are very painful. So what will they tolerate? And then if we look at the local areas or the blue area, the peri wound skin and local skin is very important for epithelialization. And we can miss sometimes maybe satellites of petechial rash or maybe infection. And we have to examine both limbs before we can really establish, is it just one little area or has it spread to other areas of the limb as well? So do a full circumferential evaluation before you actually um, decide on what topical treatment you're going to need. And then when we're down to the wound itself, it's important we look at the tissue type, we look at infection, we look at the exudate levels and the consistency of the exudate. And is there odor there? And what are the issues that are... Um, important for the patient. So just uh, in relation to monitoring and accurate uh, recording, it's important that we have a weekly accurate, uh, either a digital photograph or a ruler or something recorded in the wound assessment chart to establish, are we actually making progress? Or as Kersey said, if it doesn't heal within the usual four to 12 weeks, do we need to reach out to our other colleagues and get them to have a look and examine the patient in their clinic. Do we need to refer on? And do we really need a biopsy here now? We're not making any progress at all. So I would advise that um, you would get the patient involved. They're usually very keen to monitor their own wounds with their own telephone. So um, I think with COVID at the moment, we're relying a lot on uh, digital photography of patients to take pictures with their phone with a ruler measurement in the picture so that we can see the progress of the wound over time. Pain is very, very typical of atypical wounds. It is a huge problem and we need to be able to assess it um, on a scale um, for the patient. Very often adhesive uh, dressings can cause more pain for them or uh, maybe the wear time of the dressing is inappropriate and that can increase their pain also. So not only is it important to monitor their pain um, on a regular basis, but also during uh, dressing time, um, is it going to cause them more pain and impede that wound healing? And uh, I think Kirsty also uh, mentioned uh, pain pathology as well, where the minimum um, amount of trauma can actually exacerbate their pain also. So we're all familiar with this wound bed assessment preparation. So it's, it's a time matrix or a framework. Um, it's very, very appropriate to atypical wounds because we've mentioned tissue that is uh, necrotic or dead and it needs to be debrided. So choosing the right time to debride and whether it needs to be debrided regularly is going to be key in the management of these topical or atypical wounds. So as Kirsty said, during the inflammatory stage, do not debride. But it is important then once the stage has passed that we do uh, debride appropriately with the right um, resources that are available to us and the right people um, who have the scope of practice to do this. Infection was mentioned as well, and it's really key in atypical wounds to manage the infection by talking to our microbiology team and looking at the culture and sensitivity, which isn't always the key thing, but just linking in with the team to make sure that infection is uh, managed either systemically or we can use uh, antimicrobial, antibacterial, uh, topical agents um, or um, honey or whatever topical treatment is available to you. Moisture balance is really important because with atypical wounds, you will have that trauma to the peri wound if you don't manage the moisture effectively and the exudate. The exudate can actually uh, impede the healing to the peri wound. And we really need to manage that exudate so that we, we get the appropriate margin of uh, healability 
And I saw in Elena's um, uh, picture there, she has used uh, some um, topical creams to protect the peri wound before they punch grass as well. And then the epith epidermal margin uh, epithelialization will only occur um, if we have those epithelial cells allowed to advance and cross and, and allow the wound to shrink in. So uh, when we come to topical treatments of cancer wounds, there is no topical treatment really out there that's going to actually eradicate any of these cancers. The one on the left is a lady with a squamous cell carcinoma who ended up with an amputation. And had she been um, treated early enough, uh, she may have avoided this amputation and may have got away with a skin graft or a flask. Um, and uh, the only way to remove the cancer, obviously, is to excise it and send it to the lab for histology and ensure that the appropriate margins are also taken into consideration. Otherwise, they'd have to have a re-exhibition. And I know this basal cell carcinoma on the right-hand side picture is, seems fairly innocuous and not really that damaging. But we all know basal cell carcinomas don't go away with topical treatments. They do need to be excised. They are slow growing. But something on the planter of a foot here, um, this is going to need grafting because the appropriate margins aren't going to allow for simple closure of the wound. So therefore, you will need a graft, which is going to impede their mobility even further. So it can be, um, obviously, I suppose the key message I'm trying to make here is early diagnosis will prevent uh, major plastic surgery having to be done down the line. Another uh, problem is cellulitis, and we can't really treat uh, cellulitis with topical treatments either. We're looking at systemic antibiotics here. They're not going to really uh, tolerate compression at this stage because it's going to be too painful and too hot and too swollen. However, we can mark the cellulitis so that we can monitor it closely, and we can elevate the limb also to try and reduce some of the oedema. Pyoderma gangrenosum is uh, really difficult to treat um, if the patient won't tolerate compression. And initially, when they're in the painful stage and they haven't started on um, a steroid treatment, um, it can be challenging topically or what to, tr what to try and put on it. But, um, you know, you can use polymeric uh, dressings, which will cleanse, cleanse and support and relieve pain and also promote healing. Um, a biopsy is essential to, to diagnose a pyoderma gangrenosum, and so it's important to get dermatology involved at this stage. Uh, we would, uh, once the immuno uh, in, in the, uh, um, the inflammation has settled, then it is appropriate to get somebody into compression um, and use local uh, simple um, silicone dressings to try and absorb the exudate and keep the patient comfortable. Think about the wear time, and if you do get them into compression, any sort of light compression is better than full compression, and you can encourage them in time then to, to move forward into full compression, should they have the appropriate uh, blood supply and that they've had their ABPI done, as Kirsty mentioned. So then when we talk about cleansing solutions, now there's a dearth of literature really out there when it comes to cleansing solutions. But we know we, we use water, we use eusol, we use hydrogen peroxide, we use even dermatologists love potassium permanganate soaks. So all of these can be really, really irritating and maybe painful for the patient. So we have to anticipate that. There's different techniques of mechanical irrigation or um, hydro debridement or even just soaking them in a bucket or hosing them. And I suppose if you look at the bad guidelines, um, if somebody has a chronic wound, such as an atypical wound, they are going to need regular cleansing by using potable uh, water over the shower and just gently um, irrigate the area to remove plaque and any skin scales because infection can uh, harbor underneath these scales. And it's important to use a hydromol and then an emollient to keep them nice and moist so that they don't get the cracking in the skin that's going to actually cause cellulitis. Frequency, again, it's a bit uh, debatable in the literature how often we should be cleaning our wounds. Um, obviously, if they're in compression for a week, you're not going to be able to clean them or put on topical steroids in between. But if it is an infected wound, you're going to have to do it more frequently, obviously. Here you can see the difference, um, and it's important for us to be able to recognize what's infected and what is just chronic inflammation. 
so that patients aren't being prescribed antibiotics inappropriately and that we do get the correct diagnosis. And you can see the pseudomonas on the left and just chronic inflammation on the right. We have lots of um, antimicrobial dressings within our, our armory of the um, dressing selection. And uh, we also have lots of dressings that will help with moisture and management and so that the skin, the peri wound doesn't become irritated. Now, we use a lot of topical steroids, which can help us avoid uh, systemic steroids, but uh, we tend to use steroids um, on lower limbs if we can um, for short, sharp periods rather than using them over long periods because they can impede wound healing and they can cause infection. And then, of course, over a long period of time, it can thin out the skin, which we really don't want either. So just think about what potency to use. Think about if there's a lot of exudate there, do you want to use an ointment or cream, preferably a cream because ointments will fall off. Um, and just remember to use one fingertip unit will we'll cover a whole palm of an area of a limb. So um, think wisely about what you're going to use for the peri wound and then what you're going to use. Uh, so you don't want your steroid just to go off into the dressing either and that it will stick to the wound. So this topical steroids can be very, very useful. They can be used on their own or they can be used in combination with antifungals and antibacterials. And we tend to use the combined um, steroids uh, rather than the steroids on their own. Same with dressings. There's lots of different dressings out there. There's lots of different uh, compression systems and there's lots of different uh, bandaging systems available to us. So it's important that we've done a thorough holistic assessment. We've discussed that we think about what the goal of the week is, that we're all trying to achieve the same goal and that we're not all off going off on tangents. Very often you will see or prescribe a dressing regime and then somebody else will go off and change that dressing regime if it's done two or three times in a week. And then you're not really achieving the goal that's been set out, i.e., but, you know, if we're trying to debride the wound, we're going to use a gel for the week. If we're trying to uh, manage the exudate, we're going to use a, a foam or something that's going to absorb the exudate. And, um, you know, if it's a calcible axis and there's a lot of necrosis there, we might choose a hydrocolloid to gently lift off that necrosis. So think about what the goal of the week is and don't be chopping and changing dressings too much or you're actually wasting a lot of money and a lot of energy um, and you won't get the outcomes that you anticipate. Uh, this is just showing a, um, a hydrocolloid um, in use on a, a lower limb leg ulcer. And you can see here that it's not really, it, it's, it's great that you can leave it on, but there is a risk that it will actually leak uh, because it's not a very absorptive dressing, but it, it has its place. And again, it can cause a uh, hypergranulation. But if you see this sort of hypergranulation, you can use topical steroids to try and dampen it down with a bit of pressure or indeed you have to be aware, has it, uh, have we got the diagnosis right? Could this be a squamous cell carcinoma? And um, do we need to biopsy it uh, again? So uh, I think everybody's mentioned it's a team effort. It's very important that we don't go off and do anything in isolation, that we work as a team and that we think of the patient's welfare and what's best for them and getting the right diagnosis is really key. These three elements are important when we're treating topical uh, or atypical wounds. We must have the knowledge and the skills, but not only that, sometimes uh, we can ensure that our staff have those knowledge and have the skills, but they, if they aren't practicing regularly, they can lose those, those skills very quickly. So I think it's important that uh, we reiterate that education is key and that we must make sure that um, the uh, healthcare professionals who are providing the care know what they're doing, that they're within their scope of practice, and that they're utilizing um, the dressings, particularly advanced dressings where we're using topical negative pressure um, or larvae therapy that we're not going to suffocate the larvae, or that if we put on topical negative pressure, we know that it's indicative for this wound and that it's not going to actually exacerbate it, particularly if you put it on, like, for example, a cancerous wound. So even though the wound might appear to be fairly innocuous and nothing really bad, and it might seem like a tiny wound, or oh, what's she harping on about? This is nothing here. This can advance to be something very aggressive, like a pyoderma granulosum. So 
our advice would be don't delay, refer today if you can. And always, 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 you know, get the team involved. Don't think that you're a, an island, that you're going to heal this wound on your own. We're all in, in need of help and we shouldn't be afraid to ask for it. So atypical wounds are challenging. We must stay patient focused. We must have the accurate diagnosis algorithm. And I would advise everybody to look at the atypical wounds document and look for the algorithm. It's really, really useful. It's really helpful for us in clinical practice. And then when we have that algorithm, we can make the appropriate topical treatment choices to ensure that our patients get the best treatment in the long run. So there are my references there. And I hope I haven't gone over time. Thanks very much, um, Kirsty, and everybody listening out there. Thank you, Julie, for this excellent and comprehensive presentation. And now we are moving to our question and answers part of the webinar. And please type your question if you have not done it so yet. But we have some questions. We can start for the first ones. And I'm really glad that we have a colleague from South Africa. And he has a question to Elena. Calciphylaxis patient, can you palpate calcium deposits under the skin in the peri wound and on the lower leg in this patient? If not, what wound could this be? In my patient, these calcium deposits are visible on x-ray too. My patient is not on dialysis, but has early stage kidney failure. And the patient has had a biopsy with no specific diagnosis. So please, Elena. <laughs> Okay, Calcif uh, calcifications in arterial sclerosis um, and as in calciphylaxis, uh, they are uh, uh, very, very small. You won't palpate them. Uh, when you palpate uh, calcium uh, and in a, in a wound, in a chronic wound, well, it, it, it will be dystrophic uh, calcification. This is typical of chronic wounds when there's lots of inflammation there are lots of cells that die so intracellular calcium accumulates and you can have a species of bone and uh, so this can be seen in um, in uh, x-ray and uh, treatment is uh, to get rid of this uh, calcium you can al also have calcium when you have flebolites and this is typical when he, uh, you have a uh, venous like ulcer, long stand venous like ulcer, you have uh, calcium in the vein. But this is when you see the, the x ray, uh, it, uh, calcium follows the trajects of the vein. So I think in your case, we are talking about a dystrophic uh, calcification. Um, then also another question to Elena is from my colleague from Finland. Is there any difference between scalpel and punch biopsies in terms of cosmetic results on the donor area? Thank you for this question, because uh, in fact, the, there are differences regarding aesthetic results. Um, regarding the, the, the final um, scar of the donor side, we can have hypo or hyper pigmentation we, uh, depending on the phototype and uh, if we take it with a punch we may have a circular shaped scar well hyper or, or a hypo pigmentation and this is uh, when, when you have geometrical uh, shapes on on, on, yeah, on the skin this is not very physiological so one of the, uh, the uh, well, we, we try to use the scalpel uh, because of different, uh, because of different causes, but uh, one of them is because we have a better result. It's like, a, and if you take the, the grass very, uh, mm, uh, uh, one uh, uh, without lots of space between them, the result may be as uh, if you take it with a dermatome and, and from time to time, it's even better with, uh, with punch grafting. So yeah, the aesthetic results, not the same. <laughs> Hey, and the next question to Elena also, 
in cases of martyrial ulcer before applying the crafts to some type of deprivement be performed. Yeah, when, when deprivement is possible, well, uh, because patients sometimes have lots of pain, we try to graft in the better conditions, obviously, but uh, it's not always that easy. Even if we use, uh, for instance, sevoflurane, we irrigate these derived uh, from ether in the clinics, uh, or we use some topical anesthetics such as EMLA, but from time to time, this is very painful for the patients, even with medication. So, and I'm not that sure if um, necrosectomy or debridement of um, necrotic tissue is very beneficial for martial leg ulcers. For sometimes, uh, inflammation can uh, can uh, arise. Uh, so that's why some people think uh, that martial leg ulcers are pyoderma gangrenosum. There's a difficult some difficulty in diagnosis because uh, when you debride martial leg ulcers, you may have a worsening of the lesion. So what we do in our clinics, we are not very invasive. We graft the earlier as possible. And even if we have a terrible wound with necrotic tissue there, we don't mind. We just graft around the necrotic tissue and we can re-graft the next time. And even if no grafts adhere to the wound, we will have pain reduction, which is most of the times the most essential uh, objective the first procedure. This is very informative, Elena. Thank you for that, because usually we have used to think on the contrary, that the wound bed has to be perfectly clean before doing the crafting. So thanks for giving us the courage to do, <laughs> to do this. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're done, we're done, but <laughs> okay, but is it possible to do skin crafting or punch crafting in the house of the patient? Do you, you do, have you done it? I've never done it because I don't go to the house of the patients, but it could be done there. It's an outpatient uh, basis procedure, so yeah, it's perfect to do, yeah. Yeah, why not? If you why have, not? Yeah. And then the last question for Elena, how you treat the craft and the extraction point? So I think it means the donor area. The donor side, well, there are different resins that you could use. In our clinics, we use uh, calcium alginate resins. We leave them dressing at least for four or five days. Then we change it with lots of water. And uh, if we have uh, mm, um, bleeding points, we will put another, uh, once again, uh, calcium alginate. But sometimes, and when the donor site is very small, we just uh, leave it and we can put uh, um, creams with a hyaluronic acid or zinc or, or nothing, you know, because this is an acute wound. So uh, we don't know which is the best dressing for the donor site. And we don't know even if afterwards, after stopping the bleeding, you should use anything because this is very acute and superficial and clean wound. So. Thank you. And then I have one question to Tuli. Well, how can you explain that topical cortical theories are beneficial in many types of atypical wounds? Um, well, it does avoid us having to have systemic um, antibiotics for a long period of time. And I talked about the potency. So maybe it's useful to go in for a short, sharp shock rather than using them for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. And I, I could say that corticosteroids are the secret weapons of dermatologists also. <laughs> do you agree, Elena? Yes, I do completely agree. <laughs> okay, now we are coming into the end of this webinar. Thank you for taking part for this webinar and for all your questions. And I, we are happy to see that you are all over the world. And don't forget, you will be able to access the video recording of the webinar via the Yuma webpage. And please follow this link, what we do webinars. And if you want to learn more about all other Yuma activities, please visit our website and follow us on social media at, at Yuma Wound. And we also really hope 
to see you at Yuma Virtual Conference on the 18th and 19th of November 2020. We have there an exciting program of activities. And this year you have a unique chance to attend Yuma where selected sessions will be translated into Spanish, French, Italian and German. And these language streams are available at a reduced price of only 25 euros per re registration. To get more details, please visit again Yuma's website. And thank you again. Stay safe and have a good night. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, guys.